Hello friends, my goodness, I want to welcome you today to the Cane Creek Cowboy Church. Brian Biggers, I got something to tell you. Jesus loves you, I love you. My goodness, there's two right there. Surely you got somebody else that loves you. Greatest thing in this world is to be loved by Jesus and to love people and to love people in return and love Jesus in return for the way that he's loved us. I'm telling you, Jesus is crazy about me. He loves me. I wrote this song. You're going you're gonna to love this song. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. Isn't that a good one right there? I might publish that thing. All right, we got to get right to it. We're going to have a grand time today. We're going to the greatest sermon ever preached. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount preached by Jesus. It is the greatest teaching on kingdom life or God life or Jesus life. But Jesus came to bring us into a brand new way to live. He didn't come to just transfer us from hell to heaven, although that is wonderful, especially the older I get, can I get a witness? He came to give us a completely new way of living called kingdom living. And the number one thing that Jesus talked about while he was on this earth was the kingdom of God. Kingdom life, a different way of living. And he told you and I when we pray, we're to pray, your kingdom come. Lord Jesus, your will be done on this earth the way it is in heaven. And this great sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, it covers three chapters in the Bible, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. I have read this sermon hundreds of times. It's, it's just the greatest teaching. It's a timeless teaching on how to live with God and how to live with people. Listen, many of our great uh, scholars, founding fathers, sages through the years have said, if people would just live by the Sermon on the Mount, whether they believe in God or not, if we would just live by the Sermon on the Mount, we'd build the greatest civilization ever. Of course, that's not going to happen until the Prince of Peace comes back. So we're looking in the Sermon on the Mount today, and we're looking at the, the core of the Sermon on the Mount, which is called the Beatitudes. He begins this teaching by giving us eight attitudes. And they're eight heart attitudes that he wants his people to adopt. They're the heart attitudes of people who walk in the kingdom. Now, they're called the Beatitudes. And every one of them, this is unusual, everyone begins with the same word, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. The word blessed, you know, if you're from the country like I was years ago, country preacher said, blessed. Blessed, and then they'd say, bless him, Lord, if somebody got happy in church. But the word blessed is the Greek word makarios. And it just, it is it's one of the most beautiful words in the Bible, one of the beautiful, most beautiful words in creation. It simply means God is going to do something for you. To be blessed is mean, means that God has shown favor to you. Uh, for instance, Numbers, let me quote to you from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you, keep you. Make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's when God just chooses to be good to somebody and he blesses people. He, he blesses them with uh, the scripture teaches us. I, I wish in all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into your life. Jesus comes into your life. He makes things right on the inside. Then we have peace on the inside. Then we have great joy on the inside. And then the Bible talks about health. God, listen, God created people to live healthy. Jesus healed every single person he came to. No doubt about it that he is pro-health. And he wants us to be in good health. But also that the Bible said that you would prosper in all things. Your marriage, your friendships, your business, your endeavors... Listen, God created man to do well. That's why the first thing God Almighty ever spoke to a man, he created man, he put him in the garden. First thing he ever said in Genesis 2 was, be fruitful. Be fruitful. Of course, that Hebrew word means be successful. Create. Show me what you can do. I've given you the planet. I've given you all the resources. Now you go be successful or be fruitful. And the heart of God is that people be successful and be fruitful. Of course, the heart of Satan is to steal kill and destroy to steal the success and the prosperity and the great families and the great lives and the great things God has planned for us. And that's why we come to this Sermon on the Mount, this great little passage called the Be Attitudes, the Be Blessed Attitudes. Some people call them the Be Happy Attitudes because the word makarios, blessed, also means happy, to be happy. Well, you're happy because God does great things for you and we're blessed. Now listen to me carefully. <clears throat> 
Jesus teaches us this. I'm going to give you the attitudes that I'll bless. It's up to you to choose to walk in them. And these are hard attitudes that we, listen, we cultivate these attitudes and we, we walk in these attitudes with the help of the precious Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's in our lives. The very Spirit that raised Jesus' dead body from the grave lives inside of me and lives inside of you if you're born again. And He's, all, he's our helper. He's our helper. He's our teacher. And He's always cultivating. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, As we behold the beauty of Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God transforms us into that same image, glory to glory, little bit by little bit, by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Bible teaches us the Holy Spirit comes in our lives. We get saved, and He begins to work in us to turn us into the very image of Jesus. Now, dear, let me tell you about these eight attitudes. It is the very heart of Jesus. These eight attitudes are the very heart of Jesus, and they're the, the attitudes that God blesses. They're the attitudes that bring great prosperity in life. They're the attitudes that make for a great family. Let, let me tell you something. If you want to be happy in life, you learn these great attitudes, cultivate them, and listen, pray to the Holy Spirit. Pray to Him, say, help me. Father, I want to have the heart. This is just the heart of Jesus. I want the heart attitudes of Jesus, and I want to cultivate these in my life. Now, let me tell you something about what the, about what the Scripture teaches. Our Heavenly Father does not bless religion. One of the most damnable lies ever told, that if you'll become religious, God will do good things for you. He doesn't bless religion. If you read the Scriptures carefully, Jesus came down hard on religion. He doesn't bless perfection. Thank God He doesn't bless perfection. Man, if He blessed perfection, I'd be the last in the line. He, I, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to compassion, great in anger, slow to anger and great in goodness. The Bible's very clear. He doesn't bless knowledge. Now, I don't know what happened, but in my generation, we got all hung up on this thing that it's all about learning more, learning more. And we we got these great big heads full of knowledge and these little shriveled up tiny hearts. That's the character of a modern Christian. Great big head full of knowledge, knowledge, another Bible study, another discipleship program, another seminar. Listen, the Bible said knowledge makes arrogant. It's love that edifies. That's 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Knowledge makes people arrogant. But love builds people up. Rather than learning more, we should learn to love more and desire to be more like Jesus in knowledge. Let me tell you what God blesses. He blesses attitudes. Now, dear ones, people look on charisma, skill, speaking ability, education, yada, yada, yada. Let me quote to you the great verse. Here's the great verse. 1 Samuel 16, 7. God Almighty sent Samuel to find him a king. And he saw a very strong, handsome, tall, articulate man. He said, that's got to be the one right there. And God spoke to him and said, not him. That's the way y'all look at things. I'm different. And then here's this great verse, 1 Samuel 16, 7. Look, not on his appearance, nor his countenance. For man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. I love that verse. 1 Samuel 16, 7. Man looks on the outside. God looks on the heart. Dear, listen to me. God always looks at the heart, and he blesses heart attitudes. When we measure a man in our culture, even in our churches, you know, we put the tape around his head, his bicep, his billfold, maybe a woman's backside, which is foolish. God puts the tape around the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, education, skill, polish, looks, yada, yada. But God stares at the heart, the heart inside. Jesus said of the religious leaders of his day in Matthew 23, he said, you're like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of death and rot and corruption. We look at the outside, the singing voice, the speaking, the money, but God always looks straight at the heart. That's why He blesses attitudes. That's why, dear ones, you and I are going to develop these heart attitudes that He blesses. Eight attitudes that God has promised He'll bless if we'll walk in them and cultivate them and let this become our lifestyle. Here we go, one through eight. Number one, the Bible said this in Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Good God Almighty, how I like it. I love that verse. Listen, poor in spirit has nothing to do with your checkbook. You can be a multimillionaire and be poor in spirit. You can be penniless and be an arrogant snot. Arrogant snot's the, the in, uh, Hebrew word there. All right, listen. Poor in spirit very simply means I need God. I need God. It, the, the simple truth that I need God's help. What does the Bible say? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. They really need God. They depend on Him. They need His help. The, the poor in spirit is uh, versus pride. Let me tell you what the pride's all about. I can handle it. 
I can do it. I did it my way. I don't need anybody else. I'm a self-made man. I'm self-sufficient. That's called pride. Listen, dear ones, the Bible is very clear. God resists the proud, but he shows great kindness to the humble. And you and I need, I had a dear friend of mine. He was a black man and a great singer. He wrote a song one time. He would come to my church. I love this man dearly. We'd sit and talk and have the best time. He wrote a great song years ago. It was called, and it went like this. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. I used to think I was a mighty big man, but I can't even walk without you holding my hand. What a great, that's it. That, that song captures poor in spirit. Poor in spirit simply means you look up and you say, I need you. I need you. One of the reasons that David, David of Israel, King David was so blessed by God was because David said over and over, if you read the Psalms, over and over he said, I am poor and needy. I am poor and needy, but my eyes are on you. I am poor and needy, but my eyes are on you. David kept his eyes on God and he told him over and over, I've got to have your help. I've got to have it. Listen, you want God to bless you? You quit being so self-sufficient. You look up to heaven and tell him, I need you. Well, one of my favorite old songs when I was young, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. We need to develop an attitude that says, I need God to take care of me. Number two, verse four says this, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Now, my goodness, many people have misinterpreted this verse and they think it, re they think it reads, blessed are those who whine. No, it don't mean whine. Mourning is totally different. Here, here's the word, compassionate. To mourn means your heart is touched with the pain of other people. You look at what people are going through and you feel for them. That's what it means to mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Now, on the other side of compassion, a heart that cares about, and listen, this is the heart of Jesus. The Bible said Jesus looked at them and he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he saw a mother who'd lost a child. She said, woman, do not weep. And Jesus, he had a tender heart. He was compassionate toward people. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were some of the most hard-hearted people I've met. And God Almighty, listen to me. Some of the religious people I've met are some of the most hard-hearted people I've ever met. And that's the reason that God doesn't bless their lives. They're just religious. He blesses a tender, compassionate heart. So it says, blessed are those who mourn. Mark chapter 3. Jesus goes into the synagogue. There's a man with a deformed hand. And, and the ministers are watching him. It's on the Sabbath. And the Bible said they watched him to see if he would heal so they could accuse him. And they're more concerned about breaking one of their petty little rules than there are this man whose hand is deformed and he can't even work, can't, can't make, a, make a living supply for himself. And the Bible said that Jesus looked around at them. Listen to these words. God looked at them being grieved by the hardness of their heart. Those hard religious hearts that didn't care about a man's condition, didn't care about people. All they cared about was keeping rules. And how many Pharisees have I met? They'll cut your heart out over some simple rule. I mean, my goodness, I've had fistfights almost for people because somebody carried a piece of cake into the church auditorium, into that sacred place, Pastor. My God, have mercy. Would you knock it off and get the heart of God? Blessed are those who mourn. They got tender heart. Listen, you want to be blessed by God? You feel what God feels when you look at people. Tell him, I want to feel what you feel when you see people. I want to care about people. Man, I love this verse. Number five. All right, let's go on number three. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. The trusting, those who trust God. Now, there was, a lot of people think meek means weak. No, no, Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 he said, I am meek and low. Well, the guy who spoke the stars in place is certainly not weak. Meek is the Hebrew word, uh, meek is, excuse me, Greek word. It means under control. All right, let, let me tell you something. A horse that has been meeked has been broken. Now, uh, my favorite horse, Sundown, huge Tennessee walking horse. Uh, he was, he was meeked. He was broken. And you know, that, that rascal, he weighed almost 1,200 pounds. Now, you know, I don't care, I don't care how tough a cowboy is. 1,200 pounds is going to whoop 200 pounds any day it wants to. And you can cowboy up there if you want to and be tough. Bottom line is that horse will whoop me if he wanted to. But meek means even though he didn't have to submit to me, even though he was stronger than me, he submitted to my authority. He wouldn't move until I said go. If I pulled the reins right, he would turn right. That, that, meek means under control. Meek, the opposite of meek is self-reliant. I'll take care of myself. I'm not going to wait on God. I'm not going to trust God. God's not going to open doors for me. I'll just take care of myself. That's the opposite of meek. 
A meek person may be a very powerful person. They may be a strong personality, but they're trusting God. If he wants me to have this job, he'll get it for me. I'm not going to be calling all over, all over town, calling in favors. I'm going to trust God to take care. And they, they're people that are just, they're yielded to the control of God in their lives. And they, they look up to heaven and say, you do it for me, sir. You do it for me, sir. Number four, I love this. Blessed, <clears throat> blessed are those who hunger, verse six, Matthew five, verse six. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. The word is justice. It was righteousness. The, they're so, righteousness is so out of vogue in our nation right now. But the root word of righteousness is simply right. We want people to be treated right. We want to be treated right. We want, we want people to be treated fairly. It's called justice. And the Bible said, Blessed are those who long for people to be treated right. They hunger and thirst for righteousness. They, they're, they're tired of take, people taking advantage of other people and people slighting other people and people climbing over other people and people hurting other people. That, that should that grieve. If you have the heart of God, that should grieve your soul. What we want is for people to be treated right. And that's called justice. And, and he said, listen, I will bless people who hunger and thirst for things to be done right and for righteousness to be in the earth. Now, the opposite of justice is called partiality. And it's where you prefer these people to these people. You treat these people better than you do these people. And you, you hurt these people. Or you look down. You Listen, all that is from hell. Our God, the Bible calls him the righteous judge with whom there's no partiality. The Bible said he, he looks on no man's person. He respects no man's face. He is a God of justice. And let me tell you something about all the injustice that's in the earth today. You can relax because the big trial has not taken place yet. The just judge is coming back to this earth. Every single person is going to get a fair trial. Don't worry about what you see today. God is the just judge. First Corinthians says this, Judge nothing before the time when the king shall come and set everything right, and he will expose the motives of men's hearts. But we want to be a people that we want to walk in justice. And we want, to, we want to do right. We long for right. And we're going to treat people right. We're going to love people. We're going to be fair to people. If you want the Lord to bless your life, treat people well. Number five, the Bible said this, Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. I'm telling you, I am alive because... The word is merciful. The attitude is a merciful attitude. I'm alive because we serve a merciful God. He should have thrown me into hell years ago. But in his great kindness, he has shown me mercy and he has shown me grace. And the Bible said that if you, if you want to experience the mercy and the goodness of God, you got to show the mercy and goodness of God to people. Listen to me. Let me quote to you from Galatians chapter 5. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall, he be, that shall he reap. Let me quote the whole thing. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. Listen to me. Sow mercy, you'll reap mercy. If you'll show mercy to people, everybody makes mistakes. Everybody screws up. If you will be merciful, now I'm not talking about covering sin up and sweeping sin under the rug and letting people act like idiots and get away with it. I'm talking about when people make a mistake, you're gracious toward them. And you show them mercy. And you show your mate mercy. You show your children mercy. Got any kids listening to me today? How about, I got any teenagers? My one teenager listening to me? Listen to me. Show your parents some mercy. This is their first time at being a parent. Could I get some mercy for the parents out there? We need to be a merciful person the way Jesus was. And the opposite of merciful is to be a judgmental person. That means you come down hard on people. You see the worst in people. You look for the worst. Let me quote to you from the other part. This also is in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the same judgment you use, it will be brought back to you the same measure. You know this, if you're hard on people, it's going to be hard on you. Merciful to people, God's going to be merciful to you. Critical of people, you're going to have a critical spirit inside of you and you're going to be condemned all the time. If you will overlook people, so listen to the Bible says, I love this proverb says this, it is to a man's glory to overlook a transgression. Just you know, look, you don't owe me nothing. God bless you. Let's stay friends. I love you. My love for you is greater than your sin against me. We're going to be a merciful people. God blesses merciful people. You know why? The foundation of his throne is mercy. And Jesus in his great mercy and love. That's what the great gospel is about. The mercy of God. When I deserve judgment, I found mercy and grace. We want to be merciful people. Number six, I love this. I'm going to quit saying I love it. I'm just going to tell you, I love it all, so I don't have to say it anymore. I love this. 
Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. A unified heart. Now, dear ones, a lot of people think this means a perfect heart. You never make mistakes. You don't get tempted. You don't have evil thoughts running through your mind. Listen, you can't help what flies through your mind. Hell puts those thoughts in there. A pure heart, dear ones, a pure heart is a single heart. It's a unified heart. You know, if I got garbage in my heart, well, that's not a pure heart. But if I've got gold and silver, that's not pure gold. Pure means pure, one thing. And a unified heart is a heart that has put Jesus on the throne. You, you know what the opposite of a unified, uh, pure heart is? It's Jesus on the side. Yeah, I got a little bit of God in my life. I go to church on Sunday. I give a little money once in a while. I try not to cuss as much as I used to. That's not a pure heart. That's a divided heart. That's, I, look, I give God a little bit of my heart, but I'm sort of the boss. I sit on the throne and, you know, I'm into money. I love my money and I love this. And that's a divided heart. That, that's not a pure heart. You know, a pure heart is a heart that's been captured by Jesus. And you have put him on the throne because you've seen his beauty and he's worthy. And listen, the Bible, listen, what, let me, let me, listen, the greatest commandment ever given. When Jesus said, what it was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He didn't say, Love the Lord your God a little bit. Give God a little bit of time, a little bit of money. That's not what he said. Listen to what he said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Man, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Listen, dear ones, if, you, if you've ever seen Jesus, if you've ever heard his voice, you've ever seen his beauty, the compassion in his eyes, the wonder of his love, the graciousness of his spirit, you can't help but be captured. You know what you think about when you think about this? This is back to Revelation chapter 2. Here's a young lady. You know, maybe a girl in high school or a girl in college. And she meets this young man. He's a wonderful young man, godly young man. He's good looking. He's strong. He cares about her. He's sensitive. He's tender. He sweeps her flat off her feet. Hallelujah. I mean, he grabs her heart and she adores him. He, he's, she thinks about him. She loves him. She, she, you know what? She's pure in heart now. Her heart has been captured by this boy. Well, dear ones, Jesus is worthy of our hearts being captured. And a pure heart, listen to what it says, a pure heart will see God. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a pure heart to go to heaven. No, 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 not even close. You have to be saved to go to heaven. You have to be saved to go to heaven. Listen to this. A pure heart, blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. It means you'll see God in this life. When your heart is pure toward God, you'll see Him do things for you in this life. You'll sense the Lord's hands on this family. God got me this job. God's taking care of me. That was God right there. God made this connection. Blessed are the pure in heart. They'll just see God doing things around them all the time. Listen, a pure, I, I've, got, I've been married to the same woman 41 years. I adore that chick. You know I love my woman. Good gosh almighty, I love her. I love, she's got all my heart. I got all her heart. And she loves me the same way. I would not want a wife that loved me 40% of the time. And then went and saw Harold or Rufus or Doofus, you know, a couple nights a week. I, I either want all of her heart or I want nothing. You understand that? You understand that? Why would Jesus get any less? Why would the creator of the universe lay down his life for me, love me like nobody's ever loved me? Why should he get anything less than a completely pure heart? Dear Jesus, I want to love you with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, when, and we need to pray, Father, I pray for a pure heart. I want to love Jesus like crazy. I want to love Jesus. I want him to be at the center of my heart and love him like I've never loved him before. That's why the Bible said, blessed are the pure in heart. They will experience God in this life. All right. Number seven, listen to what the Bible said. Blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called sons of God. Listen to me. It did not say blessed are the peacekeepers. It was anybody can keep the peace that's already there. This is not about keeping. So we need to keep peace between people. That's not what it said peacemakers. Peacemakers can go to where there's division and strife and trouble and make peace. Now, dear ones, the peacemaker is the opposite of the peace taker. God, have mercy. Have we got some peace takers in the land? I love peace. Our hearts were designed for peace. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin in me, as the great Christmas song says. I want peace in the house. I want peace on the job site. I want peace in the church house. Good luck. I want peace in America. You can forget that. But people, God blesses people who try to make peace between people. Let me say it another. Let me say it another. I like to put it this way. Blessed are the bridge builders. Dear ones, we need some bridge builders in this land. We need some people who can build bridges between people. Anytime I'm around people and they're different from me, maybe they're another race, another age range, another socioeconomic range. Yeah, I don't care. Maybe they're just really different from me. 
I always go out of my way to try to build a bridge between me and them and to build goodwill between me and them. we got enough bridge burners. you either going to be a bridge builder or you're going to be a bridge burner. And we're burning bridges down. My goodness, we're burning bridges down in this nation right now. Jesus was not a bridge burner. Jesus came and built a bridge between men and God that men had destroyed. He's the greatest carpenter that ever lived. How many carpenters do you know could take two boards and three nails? Glory to God! Take two boards and three nails and build a bridge all the way to heaven so that man could get there back to his heavenly Father. Jesus was a bridge builder. He was not a bridge burner. That's why the Bible tells you in Ephesians chapter 4, be diligent, diligent to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Work at building bridges. Work at being peacemakers. Listen, enough of this tearing up for the sake of tearing up. We need to be a people that are bridge builders. You want God to bless your life? Bring people together. Build bridges. You build bridges between people and you be peacemaker between people and watch what He does for you. We've got one more. That's number seven. Number eight, here it is. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you, persecute you, and talk evil about you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and celebrate. Your reward is great in heaven. They persecuted the prophets. Now, i got to say something here. A lot of Christians think they're being persecuted because they're Christians. No, you're being persecuted because you're a goofwad and you act like an idiot. You don't get credit for being persecuted for being an idiot. No, no, listen. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. You know what we call this right here? Committed. 100% committed. I want you to listen to what Jesus said. This is Mark chapter 8. Follow me. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this wicked and sexually immoral generation, of him I will be ashamed when I come back with the holy angels in my Father's glory. Jesus said this. My people need to stand up and speak my truth. They need to stand on my truth. Now listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. We don't need to be a bunch of arrogant jackasses, rude, hateful, unkind. We need to be a humble, gracious people, but we need to tell the truth. It is truth that sets people free. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we need to be a loving, gracious, kind people, but we need to stand up. There's an old song. Y'all notice how old people like old songs like me. Old people like me, like old song, old stone, you go like this. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. We need to be a people who graciously stand up for Jesus and stand up for truth, but we need to do it in a Christ-like, compassionate way. The Bible said this, everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Let me ask you a question. Was Jesus persecuted? How about John the Baptist? How about all the prophets? How about all the disciples? How about all the apostles? Everybody that ever took a stand for Jesus is going to get whacked somehow. Listen to me. The Bible says this. you got to choose. We're living in a day where you got to choose. Are you going to follow Jesus? Now, the opposite of a committed is a fair-weather friend. I'll follow Jesus when it's easy, but if the going gets tough, I'm out of here. I'm not going to stand up for him anywhere else. I just, I just want a little bit of God, but I don't want to go too far with this Jesus stuff. Doc, you need to get off the boat right now. Jesus has only taken committed followers, and we need to be a people who say, I have decided to follow Jesus, and then sing that second verse. Though none go with me, glory to God, still I will follow. We need to be a people who make up our minds. I'm not going to be ugly about it. I'm not going to be hateful. But if following Jesus costs me some friends, costs me some money, Cost me my name or reputation, so be it. Let, th- let them deal with it. I'm not going to get ugly with them. But I've decided to follow Jesus on the issues. We've got to love what God loves, and we've got to hate what God hates. He loves people. He hates sin. And we need to be able to tell the truth and love them. Now listen to me. These are the eight attitudes. Here they are. Number one, I need God. Number two, my heart is tender toward people, human suffering. Number three, I trust God to take care of me. Number four, justice. I want people to be treated justly and right. I want people to be treated well. Number five, merciful. Friend, you don't owe me a dime. I choose mercy. Number six, a unified heart, pure in heart. I want to love Jesus with all my heart. Number seven, I'm going to be a bridge builder, not a bridge burner. I'm not going to tear relationships up. I'm going to bring people together. I are a peacemaker. And number eight, I've decided to follow Jesus. And if I get some flack for it, well, so be it. Let, as Mr. Darlin said, let the rear end drag and keep on going. Glory to God. These are the attitudes that God bless. Now listen, choose these attitudes. You've heard God's word. And if you need to look it up sometimes, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through, th- 1 through 12. God's word, very clear. You've heard it now. 
Choose it. Listen, pray. Say, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me to be like Jesus. I want the attitudes of Jesus in my heart. I want to be like Jesus. I, I want to be just like Jesus wants me to be. And I want to thank you, dear Holy Spirit, for working in my life. You're so good. Thank you for being the one who came to help me develop the heart of Jesus. Dear ones, God blesses the heart of Jesus and his people. Let's choose to follow Jesus and be blessed beyond measure and experience his blessing. Listen, I've been there. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, but I've done some things right. I've chosen to follow Jesus. And I'm telling you to be blessed by God, just to have his spirit resting on you, his peace, his joy, his happiness, his hope. Just to have the touch of God on your life is well worth anything. I've had the favor of God on me. I mean, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Listen, follow Jesus 100%. Give your life completely to Him. There is nothing on this planet worth missing the kingdom for on this earth. Praise God nor the next. All right, time's up. I got to quit. I love you. I love you. I love you. Jesus loves you. I hope your mama loves you. Now you go love somebody because Jesus loves you. God bless you, Brian Biggers. Cane Creek Cowboy Church. Till next time, hallelujah. And if, if Jesus comes back, but listen, how about this? Here, there, or in the air, wherever we see each other again, we'll let Jesus be Lord and it'll be wonderful. God bless you. Goodbye.